Uh, my name is Andy Weisskopf. I'm with Sana Biotechnology, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to, uh, to the final day of, of this year's uh, CGTP conference. Um, looking back on the last couple of days, uh, the, the presentations that we've heard and the discussions that we've had, um, I'm really struck by the wide range of, of topics that, that we've covered. Um, we've had uh, presentations on everything from gene editing to supply chains, uh, critical quality attributes of AAVs to um, you know, uh, best practices in selecting donors for allogeneic uh, cell therapies and, and potency assay strategies. It, it's remarkable how much we, we've covered, and I think it's a testament to, to really how diverse the field of cell and gene therapy has become. And I think implicit in all that is obviously the question of you know, how do we regulate the CMC of such diverse products? Um, and that is exactly what we are going to be turning our attention to uh, this morning with our, our final two sessions of, of this year's program. Uh, our, our keynote presentation uh, with uh, Dr. Peter Marks, uh, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. And then at 10.30, our, our regulatory session, uh, which we've uh, brought together uh, regulators from, from all over the world, uh, I think six different countries, who will be able to share with us their perspectives on, on how they view uh, the, the regulation of the manufacturing and quality of, of these products. Um, and we're really looking forward to a, to a really excellent dialogue with, with them. And really, today's program, I think, underscores one of the truly unique aspects of not just CGTP, but really the whole CAS family of conferences, and that is, the, the involvement and the participation of, of regulators from, from all over the world. Um, they're not just presenters, they're not just panelists. Um, each year when we get together and start building a program, uh, they are on our committee, they are our, our co-chairs for these sessions. And so you know, when, when you see you know, each year's program come out with the agenda and the topics that we're gonna be discussing, it's not the product of a one-way monologue where industry is saying this is what's important to us, uh, it is really the, the product of joint discussion and really a, a reflection of what is important for all of us to be discussing, both those of us who are developing these, these advanced drugs as well as those who are regulating them. Um, this really is one of the few venues where, where we can have uh, really open dialogue about, about CMC uh, strategy and, and all the aspects that go into ensuring the quality of these products and, and, and how they're regulated. Uh, so suffice to say, I'm very excited about today's program. Uh, with that, let me turn to, uh, to introducing our, uh, our, our keynote speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Peter Marks. Um, leading up to, uh, to, to this year's conference, it is hard not to reflect on the fact that um, four years ago at our, at our inaugural CGTP conference, uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Dr. Marks as our keynote speaker back then, uh, just up the road in, in Bethesda. And, um, and I remember coming away from, from the presentation, I think he had, he had shown some, some, uh, some slides showing that there was this, this rather noticeable uptick in the number of, of gene therapy INDs that had been received by, by CBER in, in, in 2017. And that uh, you got the impression that the next few years were gonna be very, very busy ones for, for CBER. Um, that said, I don't think any of us could have possibly imagined what the next four years were going to look like. And, and I'm not just talking about the explosion of, uh, of new cell therapies and gene therapies that, uh, you know, that, that have entered into the clinic or, or even the, the products that have made it all the way to, to approval. But at the same time, all this explosive growth was, was happening in, in our area. CBER was also uh, at the front lines of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and the extraordinary efforts in bringing safe and effective vaccines to the public. Um, the fact that many of us are here in person uh, in a conference room uh, vaccinated uh, is, is really due in, in no small part to, to the remarkable efforts of, of CBER. Um, so if there's, there's one thing that I could uh, wish for, for Dr. Marks uh, and, and for CBER, uh, the CBER staff over the next four years is that hopefully the next four years are maybe just a little bit less interesting than, than the past four years have been. So um, with that, let me just give a little bit of background about Dr. Marx. Um, uh, Dr. Marx received his graduate degree in, in cell and molecular biology and his medical degree at uh, NYU. 
He completed internal medicine, uh, his internal medicine residency and a hematology medical oncology training at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, he has worked in academic settings, teaching and caring for patients, and in industry on drug development. He joined the FDA in 2012 as uh, Deputy Center Director for CBER and became Center Director in January of, of 2016. Uh, with no, no further uh, ado, uh, let's all please welcome Dr. Peter Marks. So th thanks very much for, for having me today. And, and given uh, what I've looked at and you've spoken about on the program for the past several days, uh, I'm probably not going to tell you a whole lot new. Uh, but that said, hopefully I can uh, uh, collectively summarize uh, some, of, some of what you might have heard and hopefully um, uh, do so with some enthusiasm about where we are headed um, uh, in the future. And I have to thank you for uh, putting up with my virtual uh, uh, attendance today. We've, we've been quite busy with vaccines still uh, and uh, keeping us uh, very, very busy at the moment. Um, so uh, I just as by way of full disclosure, I'm a United States government employee. I don't have any commercial interest to disclose. So what I, what I want to do today is tell you about our efforts at FDA to facilitate the development of cell and gene therapies. Um, I come back to what I keep coming back to over and over again, which is the importance of manufacturing in this area. Uh, review a little bit about our uh, regulatory framework, because um, uh, now we are uh, a number of years into things like regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation, uh, and can say a few words about that, uh, and uh, uh, review our resources for product developers. So just, just to make sure it's very clear right up front, um, we are very committed uh, to uh, advancing development of cell and gene therapies for populations of all sizes. I'll talk to you today uh, a lot about uh, developing gene therapies for small populations, but this is really um, uh, as, uh, as a pretext for hopefully uh, being able to expand them uh, to uh, larger settings. Um, and we realize that we're going to have to get there uh, by individualizing product development, and having a fair amount of dialogue uh, and collaboration on novel endpoints and innovative uh, clinical trial designs. I think um, just as a reflection up front here, um, uh, the dialogue that the agency has had with product developers during the COVID-19 era um, has been transformative for a number of products that ended up uh, being of great benefit um, in addressing the pandemic. And I think our challenge moving forward is to figure out how we bring the best practices um, forward and how we uh, put them into practice in the post-COVID era, uh, given the resources that we have. So with that said, um, uh, cell and gene therapy, original new uh, drug applications have continued to grow. Um, there is this little tail off you see here in 2021. Uh, uh, if you exclude uh, expanded access requests, if you included the expanded access requests, we could make these bars look uh, like they're going through the roof uh, in 2021 uh, because we had a, a fair number of expanded access requests for cellular therapies to treat COVID-19. But um, uh, if we're thinking about uh, uh, the, uh, the traditional INDs, um, uh, you know, you can see here that they have continued to grow over time. And the fact that in the middle of a pandemic, we saw a little drop off um, uh, actually uh, uh, is actually, I think, shows you how strong the field actually is. If you look at the number of investigation of drug amendments, those have continued to grow. Um, and, and as was mentioned, we now have eight approved gene therapies. Now, six of these are cell based gene therapies. One is a locally administered gene therapy, and one is a systemically administered gene therapy. Um, but uh, we are seeing these come along, and to wit, tomorrow uh, and Friday, we have uh, advisory committees uh, on uh, additional uh, gene therapies. Um, so these are coming uh, 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 along now at a reasonable pace. Uh, that's not to say that there haven't been some bumps along the way, um, but uh, I think that's normal for any field that is maturing. If we weren't seeing uh, some issues with 
bumping into toxicities, bumping into um, uh, issues with supply manufacturing. Um, this, this would not be uh, uh, real life. So let's start with just to summarize some things about cell-based gene therapy. Um, uh, and I'm gonna use uh, chimeric antigen receptor T-cell uh, therapy as, a, as the model for talking about cell-based gene therapy. That's not to um, uh, do any disservice to um, other uh, cell-based gene therapies uh, such as modified stem cells, but this is just uh, because we have half a dozen of these um, uh, approved now. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the potential advantages of using genetically modified cellular therapies, be they chimeric antigen receptor T cells or others, um, uh, is that one can actually, because you're working outside uh, of, of, of the individual, you can really know what you're doing in terms of your genetic modifications, and you can characterize the transduced cells, the genetically modified cells that you're going to administer um, with sequencing, um, and you can go as all out as you want on that. You can also make use of uh, newer technologies such as uh, CRISPR-Cas9 um, with a little more impunity um, than if you were to be thinking about administering those directly uh, to an individual, because again, you can characterize what you've done. And you can potentially um, uh, put in uh, uh, start and stop signals um, uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, deal with effector function. Uh, mainly the idea here is you'd like to have something that's like a suicide gene in the event that uh, you get into a problem um, uh, and that is possible too. Uh, so uh, lots can be done in the cell modified cellular therapy end um, uh, and these these cells can potentially provide um, a, a longer acting uh, uh, effect that is desirable, um, uh, particularly in the cancer setting. But we're also, you know, genetically modified cellular therapies uh, can be used um, in a variety of settings, including correcting uh, hered hereditary deficiencies when you're modifying stem cells, um, uh, et cetera. Now, the, some of the challenges for uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells in particular, um, but probably for some of the all other genetically modified cell therapies is that uh, transitioning from pilot scale to commercial manufacturing can be challenging. Um, and uh, this has been this concept of, you know, how do you, how do you make these cells, which are these autologous uh, versions of chimeric antigen receptor T cells, which are really each product is uh, unique um, in that it's from uh, an individual and given back to that individual. Um, it might be very uh, attractive, something to have distributed manufacturing, to have a, a device at, at, at a location uh, to make the product. Um, but that hasn't turned out to be the model that has prevailed yet. Right now, we're seeing mainly centralized manufacturing uh, where the product uh, is, is made at a central site. In other words, the cells are harvested then sent uh, to a central site, manufactured, and then sent back. It turns out that seems to be the most efficient at the moment for quality control. Um, but there are, uh, there are those in, that are having this debate uh, about whether um, uh, with uh, closed circuit manufacturing, you could uh, go in uh, a, a, a different direction. Um, and then the other, some of the other challenges, uh, not so much in the chimeric antigen receptor T cell zone for uh, hematologic malignancies, but potentially uh, for other uh, cellular therapies is how do you develop um, uh, and, and what kind of clinical trials des designs do you need to be able to show uh, effectiveness um, when you have relatively small populations? Now, the, this issue of centralized versus decentralized manufacturing comes up because we're seeing this is just a couple different manufacturers, so not to, not to pick on one, but what, what you can see um, in particular in the left-hand uh, photo here is these are now, we have these essentially closed systems that can manufacture um, uh, these products uh, or semi-closed systems. Uh, and uh, that has brought up this tension that keeps coming up of centralized versus decentralized. We'll see where that goes. 
some of this might be a little bit moot um, because um, ultimately, as we're starting to think about chimeric antigen receptor T cells for solid tumors um, uh, and other uh, disorders, I think we may be moving more into the allogeneic CAR T cell realm, which I'll say a little bit more about in a second. Uh, and that may move us uh, to more centralized manufacturing with its efficiencies. Now, chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells for solid tumors have lagged. The six products that are um, approved to date are all for hematologic malignancies, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, acute lymphoid leukemia, or multiple myeloma. Um, the problem so to date for, for solid tumors um, have, have been really uh, the, the major one has been the issue that there are not a ton of highly specific tumor antigens where you can find one antigen on the tumor surface to go after um, and uh, hit that antigen with the, with the T cell and not hit uh, normal tissues. Um, uh, and there are other issues as well, which is that, you know, solid tumors tend to be quite bulky, lots and lots of cells to kill, um, uh, and blood supplies are not uh, always perfect. So other things as well are problems. But there are now ways to get over some of these and, and issues. And, uh, and the allogeneic CAR T cells have, have made that more uh, of something that could be plausible. Um, and that's because using molecular biology, you can get rid of uh, the MHC class one molecules through multiple methods to make an allogeneic CAR T cell, which can be given uh, to a variety of different individuals. Um, uh, the nice thing about this is, although these are not batches that go on forever, um, you can make batches of allogeneic CAR T cells that, uh, you know, the lots can treat 50 to 100 people, perhaps, um, or 50 to 100 treatments. Um, uh, and uh, the nice thing about this is you can have manufacturing consistency, um, uh, you can have a product that's immediately available for those who need it, um, and it uh, can potentially ultimately reduce the cost of, uh, of CAR T cells, and that's becoming an increasing issue um, in, in terms of their application because um, if they're it being more expensive, tends to have them used only in uh, more dire circumstances, bringing the cost down might see them used in um, a, a wider variety of circumstances, some of which they might actually be more beneficial for, such as um, eliminating minimal residual disease um, uh, when solid tumors are present. Um, but really, the ability to make uh, allogeneic CAR T cells um, uh, allows one to also take the effort uh, of making multiple genetic modifications in uh, cells. And that's actually something that uh, can potentially be very useful um, uh, particularly um, uh, it, when you are dealing with, uh, with, with the solid tumors. Why? Because, as I said, you might not find one uh, tumor antigen that's good enough, but it, it turns out maybe if you had two or three things uh, on a cell surface, you might be able to find things that could actually target the tumor and spare a healthy cell. And the idea here um, is that you can both broaden and narrow antigen targeting uh, with the genetic modifications you make. Um, and you can even construct uh, CAR T cells that have a sort of Boolean logic to them, uh, which is I have to see A and B, but if I see C, I won't uh, become an effector cell. So these, these are, uh, I think, exciting ways that people are trying to move forward. We'll see where this goes. There are a, a variety of uh, sponsors working in this area right now, um, and, and we'll see where the clinical trials go. Um, I think a lot of excitement here because there is such an area of unmet medical needs still uh, in the area of solid tumors um, uh, for uh, these uh, types of additional therapies. So let me move on to uh, directly administered uh, gene therapies. Um, so, um, uh, you know, here, uh, for the directly administered gene therapies, um, I, I want to give you an example uh, and then uh, take you through where we're uh, headed. So um, the uh, FDA uh, uh, approved systemic directly administered gene therapy to date is uh, on a semnogene. Uh, uh, this is Zolgensma as the uh, uh, trade name. Um, 
This is for spinal muscular atrophy, which uh, though an uncommon disease is one of the more common uh, 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 neurologic diseases that affects uh, infants. Uh, type one spinal muscular atrophy uh, commonly presents with muscle weakness uh, evident at birth or within the first few uh, months of life, uh, ultimately uh, causes children not to uh, be able to make their developmental milestones. They don't raise their heads. They don't uh, sit. Uh, they don't walk. Uh, and eventually they end up on a ventilator and they usually die by the time they're two to three years old. Um, initially, uh, an oligonucleotide-based therapy was developed uh, to um, uh, try to address this uh, disorder, but that required repeated um, uh, administration into uh, the spinal uh, fluid uh, ultimately, a gene therapy was developed for uh, a single dose administration um, that uh, uh, was uh, found to be quite effective. The panel here on the left, uh, this little graphic shows uh, a dotted line at, 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 that you see at that number 40. Um, below that, you have abnormal, uh, abnormal milestones based on this Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, scale uh, measuring uh, disability um, uh, due to uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Above that, you're normal. Uh, and you can see 14 out of 15 children uh, treated with this gene therapy um, uh, looking out two years after treatment uh, were normal. Um, and so uh, um, uh, that is uh, quite a, uh, 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 quite a, uh, a, an achievement. Um, uh, ultimately, um, uh, you can see here on the, on the right-hand panel a, a child that's now running around at age three, quite an impressive uh, a, a achievement uh, because you don't need statisticians to say that, uh, you know, here's something we never would have seen um, uh, in, uh, uh, previously. Uh, so quite, quite a, a, an encouraging exciting thing about gene therapy that makes you want to try to have other successes like this. Um, now, uh, there are a variety of gene therapies coming up behind it. Um, and I think our goal is to try to have more <laughs> home runs like this or even things close to uh, this. So the, the reason why these are so important and you say, well, these are just rare diseases, but in aggregate, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of rare diseases. Um, and if we could address these, um, we could make a lot of lives, probably millions of lives in aggregate better. Um, uh, and uh, ultimately, we would also develop the technology that would allow us to apply gene therapy to larger populations. Um, if we ultimately hope to use CRISPR-Cas9 or other genome editing techniques, we may also need to be able to rely on this paradigm of rare diseases because at the molecular level, many larger uh, diseases, diseases affecting larger numbers of people are, are probably a series of rare diseases, rare molecular defects uh, that in aggregate make up that larger disease. And so we, we need to get this, get this right and try to develop the technology um, to be able uh, to uh, make these therapies um, uh, to uh, ad address small populations. We also have to have the regulatory environment that goes with that and the ability to make them available. This kind of transition from personalized medicine where we find the right drug on the shelf uh, uh, to treat the patient, which was a 90s concept. Um, uh, it, this is, is, goes back to um, uh, the, the time when we had the idea that you would find biomarkers in an individual and you'd look based on those biomarkers to pull off um, the, uh, the right drugs from the shelf. Um, and now we move on to this time of individualized medicine uh, where we're creating the right drug uh, to treat the patient. So this moves from ready to wear uh, to made to measure, which is essentially uh, a customized products um, and bespoke therapies, which are these gene therapy products where we make them uh, and we create them uh, to have uh, a, 
uh, a, a given application for people with rare diseases. But what are the real challenges here? We could talk about challenges in non-clinical development, uh, clinical development, and product access. Uh, and I'll touch upon them perhaps a little bit um, uh, because there are challenges throughout this whole process. Um, but one of the very basic ones that uh, really has been limiting development uh, is that on manufacturing. Uh, and that's because uh, for uh, manufacturing, uh, we're in a place where uh, right now we simply can't make these uh, in, a, a, in, in a way that is affordable uh, to study uh, in the number of patients we want to see them studied in. And once they actually even are found to be uh, uh, effective uh, or appear to be effective, the cost is so high right now uh, that it will ultimately limit their uh, applicability. And that's really because um, uh, this uh, manufacturing issue here of really having manufacturing right now in the sweet spot of making lots of product, not tons and tons of product because that's just not technically feasible yet, um, but making enough product to get a return on the investment uh, of, the, of the capital that one has put into a physical plant, uh, et cetera, um, means making enough doses of something. Um, these small runs um, uh, essentially uh, of, of gene therapy um, are really challenging. And they're even challenging for contract manufacturers uh, because um, making 20 or 30 doses of a gene therapy means you're not making uh, 100, 200 doses. And when you think about uh, bioreactors, et cetera, um, in, our current, uh, in our current systems, um, uh, the, the margins you end up, the setup cost is what you're dealing with here. There's a, a lot of analogy here uh, in, in some ways uh, 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 to uh, printing where um, uh, if you, uh, for those of you who uh, back in the day, if you set up, uh, you know, offset printing back in the day when that was uh, the way you did things, um, set up costs, whether you uh, printed 25 invitations or 2,500 invitations was very similar. And, and that's part of the problem here uh, in this area of gene therapy manufacturing. How can we potentially get further here? Well, um, uh, you know, one way to have this happen may be uh, to have uh, a, a, a device be uh, the platform of the future. Um, and that would be, uh, the idea here is that could we have uh, a device that would either help on the production end uh, or on the purification end, or both. Um, and yes, this is just a, a soda dispenser stand-in, but there actually are real people um, doing uh, the work here to try to develop devices that would um, allow purification uh, to occur um, uh, in a more automated manner. Again, that kind of democratization of gene therapy production is really what's necessary here, because right now, one of the great challenges is that so much of the uh, of the uh, the effort is placed into uh, the um, the the development of the technology uh, to manufacture gene therapy each time uh, that uh, we don't have the same amount of effort placed into thinking through um, the actual. The, the concepts the same way. So we, we waste effort in rebuilding the manufacturing over and over again. And so this might be a way to get around that. What are we trying to do? Um, well, in the last couple minutes here, I just wanna say what we're trying to do at FDA to help here. Um, one of the things we believe we can do um, is try to develop a cookbook for the development and manufacturing of bespoke therapeutics. Um, and this would be basically a set of instructions to allow people uh, to uh, more easily uh, transfer uh, the uh, manufacturing of uh, a product from their small scale production to that at a contract manufacturer. Uh, and um, uh, that is clearly uh, something uh, that has been challenging to date, which is that uh, a 
uh, academic makes the product, perhaps in, in adherent cell culture, um, is able to get positive results using that, uh, but then uh, wants to transfer that to a contract manufacturer who is going to do suspension culture. Now, making that transition has been an issue. And one question is if we were able to facilitate the transition and not have it be uh, a new birth every time, uh, could we uh, make things easier? Then the other issue is could we find ways that we take more advantage of the fact that the gene therapy vector backbone for any given adeno-associated virus is going to be this, could be the same from uh, insert to insert for a number of different inserts? And could we leverage information uh, that we know about one vector in terms of its toxicology and manufacturing from one product to another? Uh, and so here's the idea of a, of, of a gene therapy cookbook. This so happens to be Maniatis from uh, a number of years ago, but this really transformed molecular biology because it allowed everyone to have the same language of what they were doing. Um, uh, when everyone made a plasmid prep, they had the same lysis solutions, made things a lot easier. Um, on, the, on the regulatory end, the idea here is, could you have um, a, 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 a well-characterized originator product, perhaps a, the idea here would be to have a marketed product, um, and then you, could you have other products coming along behind it that use the same vector with inserts that uh, they would probably have to be obviously the right size, the right type of um, uh, product uh, expression, but could you just really focus on characterizing uh, the potency and uh, the insert rather than uh, of, the, uh, of that, rather than having to recharacterize um, the vector itself each time. And the idea would be um, you could leverage information, including regulatory submission information to try to move things along. Again, trying to reduce some of the burden here and, and expedite work. Is this possible? Well, the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium is trying to make this happen. Uh, through the uh, foundation for NIH. Um, uh, the uh, FNIH is sponsoring um, this consortium uh, with kind of a lead internal component from NIH is the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. FDA is participating. There are now uh, quite a number of companies participating as uh, partners. Uh, there are some nonprofits as well. And the idea here is both to, kind of two major aims. One, to improve um, a V gene therapy overall in terms of the vectors uh, and manufacturing, and two, to figure out whether we can uh, really expedite this process for rare diseases and make something like this leveraging of information from one application to another possible. So what's FDA's regulatory role here? Um, so we, uh, at FDA, uh, there are uh, three major medical product centers. We at the Center for Biologics Evaluation Research handle uh, uh, cell tissue gene therapies, vaccines, blood and blood products. Um, we do so under the laws of the country. Um, the, uh, the important thing I want to mention to you today is that, you know, with the 21st century cures uh, 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 that uh, was put into place in the end of 2016, uh, we had the uh, the, the development of the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy uh, expedited program um, that uh, Congress put into place. It's very much like breakthrough therapy, but more tailored to cell and gene therapies. Uh, and um, we put together a set of guidance documents uh, that explained about these different, uh, uh, the, the different uh, aspects of regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation, and also how to um, uh, understand uh, various aspects of cell and gene therapies. Um, uh, regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation really was put together uh, uh, to help um, expedite uh, product development and review uh, of this class of products, which Congress felt needed a little extra attention. Um, and so it applies to cell therapies, uh, therapeutic tissue engineering products, human cell and tissue products, and combination products um, uh, and uh, as well as to genetically modified cell therapies and cell therapies that produce durable effects. What do we mean by that is really, if something just is expressed briefly to get an antigen response, that's not in 
uh, in scope, but uh, gene therapies um, are in scope here. And the advantages of this um, are we, the products get breakthrough therapy designation like service um, with, from the agency with uh, a slightly lower bar for getting the designation as opposed to breakthrough therapy designation, which products need to uh, show potential uh, superiority to a standard of care. Here, we just have to see preliminary clinical evidence that the product can potentially uh, address unmet medical needs. And if this designation is given, in addition to getting the breakthrough therapy-like um, advantages, uh, there is also an expanded array of ways of uh, uh, fulfilling post-approval commitments uh, for uh, uh, accelerated approvals that might be granted. Now, the uh, regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation has uh, now exceeded uh, breakthrough therapy designation in terms of the number of requests that our center has been receiving. Uh, that just happened uh, last year. Um, we have given uh, a fair number of these uh, designations over time now, 68 RMAT designations out of 180 requests as of uh, March 1st. Um, it, it actually, one of the nice trends that we're seeing is a slightly uh, a slight uptick in the number of uh, requests that we're able to grant um, uh, uh, from the number of designations submitted. Uh, people seem to be getting more of a hang of uh, what we're looking for. Um, hopefully that trend will continue. Um, uh, these products, uh, many of them are cell therapy products, uh, some are gene therapies. Uh, many of them are to address, um, roughly half are to address uh, rare diseases, um, half from, and, uh, and uh, a number of them have uh, uh, orphan product designation. We've put out some guidance in this area uh, uh, and for the considerations of uh, development of chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapies um, and for uh, human uh, gene therapy products incorporating genome editing. These both are drafts for comment. Um, uh, we're trying to uh, be responsive uh, to industry's need, but also understanding that um, <laughs> we're, these guidances, uh, we will try to keep updated uh, because we're pretty sure that um, uh, guidance in this area is going to uh, only have a short shelf life. In terms of resources, I'll just finish up in the last minute or two. Uh, we have two types of meetings that I just want people to be aware of. What, one uh, is our advanced technology team meetings, uh, which allow people to come in and talk about platforms or technologies that they're interested in getting some feedback on. Um, uh, this uh, allows one to just come in with a slide deck and some questions and uh, meet with our manufacturing experts and sometimes uh, other individuals from our uh, clinical teams to get uh, some feedback um, uh, about a platform. It also serves as a way for sponsors uh, to educate us to very novel uh, new technologies. And so we appreciate these meetings. Um, uh, they, they're one of these um, types of meetings that can be beneficial uh, uh, both ways. Um, the other type of meeting uh, is more uh, sponsor focused. Um, it's uh, our initial target engagement for regulatory advice on CBER product or, interna or interact meetings. And those are really, uh, they replaced our pre pre ind meetings to allow people to come in and get early, uh, uh, early feedback um, uh, on preclinical manufacturing, clinical development plans. Really, uh, one needs to understand what product one is making and uh, a few questions about that, and it's a good way to uh, get some early advice. So just to finish up, you know, we're absolutely committed to advancing the development of cell and gene therapies for populations of all sizes. Um, and we will hopefully, um, as we come out of this pandemic, be able to apply uh, some of the real learnings we've had uh, from COVID-19. Personally, what I'll leave you with is that um, I'm hoping to try to run some pilots in the gene therapy area uh, where we try to uh, give the type of uh, real-time feedback and interaction uh, that we did during Operation Warp Speed with vaccine developers. Um, in the case of vaccine developers, it probably um, uh, saved years in terms of development time. In the case of um, uh, uh, gene therapies, the hypothesis here uh, is that it could significantly reduce development time and hopefully de-risk the process. So 
we'll see about that. And hopefully as this pandemic uh, kind of comes under better control, we'll be able to get there. So thanks for listening and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marks. Um, I'd like to invite uh, uh, folks here in, in, in the ballroom. Uh, we have microphones set up if you'd like to uh, ask a, a question. We we'd also have questions coming in online and we'll, we'll be kind of alternating uh, back and forth. So so as, as they start to come in, Dr. Marks, let, let me start off um, by asking you, you, you just mentioned here at the very end about the uh, about considering a, a pilot program for, for priority gene therapies that um, that would allow kind of rapid dialogue and response uh, for uh, to, to, to accelerate development. And I, I think back to last uh, December, a um, uh, presentation uh, given by, uh, by, by Wilson Bryan, the, the director of OTAT, uh, where he gave, I think, a very you know, clear-eyed uh, picture about uh, the, the capacity challenges at OTAT. And, and hopefully those, <laughs> that's something that can be resolved uh, perhaps in the next couple of years, and maybe you could speak about that. Yeah, so, but uh, I'll just say, uh, the, how, in the interim, programs that, let's say, do have access to a pilot like this, or programs that have RMAT, who, you know, which, which are going to garner a lot of the attention um, of, of OTAT resources for review, uh, for those programs that are pre-RMAT, uh, or, or don't qualify, um, how do they uh, navigate the you know, the, the, the waters in the near term. Right, so I, I think one of the things that Dr. Bryan has been trying to work on through the, uh, in, in his office is the, to get systems in place to allow us to have better throughput of the regular daily work, such as those applications. And um, some of that is improving our business processes. Um, we spend uh, a, a lot of time doing things that could be done better uh, by computers, um, uh, uh, or uh, uh, by uh, processes that would be checklist based rather than um, having reviewers spend uh, a lot of time uh, going through something, making a complete uh, review and then going back. So we're, we're thinking here that uh, ultimately uh, getting some of those things in place and there are some pilots that have been, uh, that are being put in place now to see if we can do that better. Uh, that will hopefully give us more time to deal with those that are generally coming through. Um, but, you know, my, my rationale here of trying to do some pilots um, is that, no, we don't have the resources right now to be able to um, give the type of individual service that we would like to be able to do. But the only way we're going to get it is if we show Congress data that says, look, uh, we did this pilot. Um, and the, uh, you know, in this number of, of cases, we were able to expedite development by X percent. Um, uh, and uh, that will hopefully uh, get both industry in terms of our user fee a a a agreements, as well as Congress excited about what is possible um, if you're able to have this type of uh, interaction. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kathy, yeah, question. thanks, Andy. I, uh, Kathy Francis and Genentech Roche. So, Dr. Marks, it was really great to hear you talk about this evolution we've been through in the last many years, actually, from personalized medicines to fully individualized medicines, where we're making them for a particular patient. And as complicated as those individualized therapies are, they also present, obviously, a lot of opportunity to be linking the information, CMC information, like product quality, to patient outcomes, where we get a one-to-one -one correspondence. And for some other products, it's one batch serves a relatively small number of patients. But I wondered if you could share some of your thoughts about what opportunities you see about how we can use that linkage between the CMC information and patient outcomes. Yeah, no, great, great thought. So I think, I think we have an opportunity here to use a lot of data that we could be garnering uh, from manufacturing quality attributes and patient outcomes potentially using supercomputing uh, and artificial intelligence to try to find 
patterns that we simply can't find right now. Um, because there are probably, th this is one of those situations that we're just not, we're not wired properly as humans to be able to, to, to consider all the different possibilities. But um, artificial intelligence, that's what, that's what it's built for, right? It's built to try to find patterns where we can't see them. Uh, and so um, I think this is one of those places where, um, it, it, you know, as, as we're seeing now, there are many different places along manufacturing that you can gather data. Uh, and capturing data as uh, as one manufactures and on, on your your quality attributes, being able to connect those um, uh, to outcomes down the line um, or other uh, other characteristics, um, to me could be a, a really a tremendous boon here. And I think this is a place where artificial intelligence and supercomputing will have application. Um, and and I know people are starting to think about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll take our next question from, uh, from online. Um, and this question uh, from, from Nadine Ritter. Uh, to facilitate FDA access to platform data for manufacturing and test methods, is it possible to consider allowing CMO production and testing DNFs for biologicals, which could be shared among a class of products of different sponsors? Could you could you repeat that question again? Sorry. Sure. No. Uh, I guess it was a mouthful. <laughs> uh, so to, to to facilitate FDA access to platform data for manufacturing and for test methods, would it be possible to consider allowing CMO DMFs for production and testing, uh, such that they could be shared across uh, a class of products between different sponsors? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's an interesting departure point for a conversation. Uh, and I, I'm happy to go back and, and talk with, I, that's one that's, a, I think it's, it's, it's it, this has come up. Um, uh, it'd be an interesting place to, to, to think about what, because there's a benefit, there's, there are people who will object to that, people who will feel good about that. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's probably worth a conversation because of, it, it, it potentially could really help facilitate things quite a bit if we could get over some of the legalistic issues um, and some of the uh, uh, technical issues uh, with the regs. So I, I will put that in the pot of things to discuss uh, because this has come up in, in discussions before internally mm -hmm. uh, as one of the, one of the things that, that um, currently is challenging based on, on, on some of the parameters, but could potentially uh, bring forward um, you know, some real benefit. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, our, our next question is at the other side of the room. Hello. Oh, hi, uh, Dr. Marks. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the number of RMAT uh, designation denials and if you've seen a common theme for why those applications are typically denied. Thanks. Yeah, yeah great, great question. Uh, you know, that's shifted over time. Originally, uh, one of the reasons why we were denying a, a number of them is because people were trying to apply for RMAT with data uh, on a different product than the one they were actually going to study. More recently, usually the most common reason for denial has not been because the product isn't going to treat a serious illness. They're generally, that's usually met. The problem has been that the data generated, um, it's, it's oftentimes very hard to see that there is a clear difference uh, in those few patients who are treated uh, than those who were not. In other words, the sample sizes that people come in to us with are very few numbers, very small numbers, and the changes are not sufficient to feel, for us to feel confident that the change is really due to the product and not just due to chance. We don't actually have any set number that we need to see, and in fact, um, uh, you know, we have uh, we have felt comfortable granting RMAT on handful or two of patients when it's a very clear difference. You know, when 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 you don't need the statistician to start, you know, calculating p values because, well, okay, they weren't making protein X, and now they're making a fully normal level of protein X, uh, and uh, they went from 
uh, not being able to do something at all to be able to do something like a normal individual. We don't need, th those, those aren't the problem children. The problem children are, are when we get um, a few patients um, where one person may have had a really good response, another person had zero response, uh, and there might be one other person who had something in between, and that's the, the nature of the whole data set. It's very hard for us to, uh, to, to feel comfortable and confident granting there. Um, and it, were it not such a commitment of resources, uh, it, would, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But because we commit, we, we commit a lot of resources, we want to feel confident that when we grant the designation, um, it's, it actually is for a product that has a reasonable chance of really being a meaningful improvement or a meaningful, a, a meaningful benefit to people. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, another question from, uh, from online, this uh, from, from Patrick Swan, uh, and, and this goes also to, I think, you know, uh, building uh, OTAP capacity. Uh, he asks, uh, with increased PDUFA funding to hire reviewers, what is CBER doing to expedite training of new staff? Besides on-the-job training, would it help to send more CBER reviewers to meetings like this? Thanks for the plug. Uh, <laughs> Patrick, I don't know where you are, but thank you. Yeah, uh, we would like to send. So, so we certainly, we have a reasonable training budget and we do want to send people to meetings. And I think one of the things that is really important coming out of pandemic now is getting people back to meetings, not just virtually, but also uh, in person as we can do so safely. Um, because that is an important thing, in, particularly in fields of cell and gene therapy where things are moving, uh, moving forward uh, the way they are. So uh, indeed, we will <laughs> uh, continue to get people uh, out to meetings. I am very grateful that um, uh, some of the travel restrictions that we used to have uh, have been lifted. Um, uh, that, I'm not talking about travel restrictions due to COVID. I'm talking about travel restrictions due to just travel restrictions. Um, and so I think that's a really good development. And uh, as we come post pandemic, I think you'll start to see us back at, uh, back at meetings in, in more force. Well, that's great. We look forward to that. Absolutely. Um, we have another question here uh, in the conference hall. Yep. Thanks. Dr. Marks, thank you so much for the presentation and this discussion. Um, so, could you please elaborate a little bit more on the difference between the CAT meeting and the Interact meetings? And also, um, with the increased number of INDs being submitted as well as IND amendments being submitted, is there any restriction in the number of times that a company could engage the FDA on a phase, uh, per phase, um, say phase one or per phase two? Yeah, it's great, great, all, all great questions. Let me start. Let me start with the first part, which is that the 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 advanced technology team meeting is really meant for platforms. It, it's not meant for uh, so. So if you have a specific product that you are bringing forward, uh, and, in other words, a gene therapy. Uh, 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 let's 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 uh, a gene therapy for hyperlipidemia. Let's say that's what it is. Um, that would not be really appropriate for a CAT meeting. On the other hand, if you were bringing forward uh, a gene therapy vector that could take a variety of different inserts, and the reason why it's a special new AAV gene therapy vector is it does not cause immunogenicity in anyone it's given to, and so it, and, and there's no pre-existing immunity to it, um, uh, that's one where uh, because it could be used with multiple different products down the line, uh, and it has some novelty to it, um, that would be more appropriate for a cat meeting than a, a product specific meeting. Now, if you had, if you happen to have that special insert already in that gene therapy uh, vector, um, that would be an interact meeting. Um, but the uh, that doesn't mean that you can't have a product. Uh, that you bring with you to the CAT meeting. It's just that the major focus at the CAT meeting is on the platform, not on the product uh, itself. Whereas the interact meetings, it's really about the product and what needs to be done to be IND enabling for that product. Um, 
And the other issue about how often you can engage. Well, you know, generally we try because we are resource limited. I, I my my personal my personal preference, just so you know, is that we would engage as much as we possibly could. But given what we're limited at the moment, we generally grant people one interact meeting uh, per uh, per product. Um, occasionally, a second if there if a long period of time has. Uh, past or if there are new or fundamentally very different questions. Um, and then in terms of later on through the, the process, um, we take, it, it's just a matter of what type of meeting one can request uh, in terms of being type A, B, or C, um, but we entertain all requests. Um, sometimes lately we've had to get back to people with written requests because we just haven't had the bandwidth as was already mentioned um, to have uh, the meetings. Um, but as we staff up, the goal is to try to have more and more live meetings because um, much as written requests are nice um, and some people like them, I think that many sponsors really, really gain from the interaction of being able to ask questions in real time and get clarifications. And it's also very clear to me that sometimes misunderstandings that occur in in, in written communication can be, you know, they go on for weeks, uh, can be resolved in 10 minutes of oral communication. So we'll, we'll work towards there. Um, we are, I, I, I want to set expectations correctly. We probably are a little ways off from getting to the staffing we need to be where we want to go. Um, so if just as a plug, if anyone, you know, anyone wants a great place to work, um, exciting things, uh, we we're looking for all of the people who, uh, uh, are interested in gene therapy, if, particularly if you have CMC experience, it's great. <laughs> Sorry, a little little uh, unabashed promotion there. <laughs> uh, no, no problem, no problem. It's uh, absolutely welcome. Um, right at the back of the room, do you have a question? Great, thank you so much, Dr. Marks. Uh, Kevin Okimura from Orca Bio. Just wondering, uh, one of the points you brought up is the uh, tech transfer of uh, from institutions to CMOs. Uh, you brought the example of the change from adherent to suspension culture. Just want to understand your thoughts about uh, potential pitfalls in tech transfer and comparability protocols, and how would you you would recommend that we uh, navigate those waters? Yeah, so so I, I think this is this is really a, a this is really a, the, one of the reasons for trying to find kind of a, a, a standardized way of doing this because oftentimes the problem is that if you ask an academic a, a investigator, oh, have you considered the potency of your gene therapy? They look at you and 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 like what? Um, uh, and uh, and you know the 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 issue here I think is. The idea here would be, could we have uh, academic investigators as they um, develop their product use a given recipe um, and perhaps look at certain quality attributes, percent empty capsids, um, uh, you know, uh, residual uh, DNA impurities, et cetera. And then if we had those characteristics early on uh, and we had a a set transfer methodology that was followed repeatedly, hopefully one would then be able to more reproducibly transfer the products knowing where you started out with some uh, key attributes and, and where you were ending up. It probably would take some, uh, just again, by way of full disclosure, probably would take some doing to sort that out at first. But like most things in life, you know, um, the I think the, uh, the setup cost at the beginning to get that right will be very well repaid uh, by the fact that instead of having dozens upon dozens of uh, investigators each year struggle to transfer uh, their gene therapies into CDMOs, it could actually go smoothly. Thank you. Uh, going back to a question from from online, uh, this is uh, this is from Jarrett Scalzo and. And I, I think they're referring here to um, uh, your comments with regards to, uh, uh, to decentralized manufacturing and closed systems on site. Uh, the question here is, uh, when you say device to scale manufacturing, 
Are you referring to these systems potentially being classified as medical devices? Uh, it is my understanding that industry wants to steer clear of these scalable manufacturing systems being classified as, as medical devices. Yeah, I, 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 you're, you're, you're very good point here. That I, I think the idea here is that, and this is, this is, this, there's some tension here, right? There's this idea of, of, I, I, of, of, of trying to, I think what, what industry is probably talking about is how do you deal with the situation of decentralized manufacturing? Industry, you, you have this potential idea that you essentially have, do you have one license holder that then has essentially a lot of different sites around uh, that they are essentially producing a, a, a biologic at. Um, and otherwise they're point of care devices. Uh, and so I, I think uh, for, for right now, um, for, for these products, I think the, the, easiest, the easiest way often to think about them using the models we have now is that you have essentially one manufacturer and these are all just different manufacturing sites um, uh, that uh, under the one license, as opposed to uh, otherwise, you have to deal with individual. You know, you're you're having people making products, and do you have to license uh, all these different individuals? So, um, I, there there are models. The model that 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 works probably is the concept of a license holder uh, that's responsible for the quality control at each of these um, uh, distributed sites. I think that's what that that ask was. I might have gotten. I hope I understood the question right. No, no. I think I think that's clear. So thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, thanks, Dr. Marx, for the the presentation and the time with us today. Uh, I'm Alex Bumersas from Vossan Consulting, and I have a question on the PDUFA Seven commitment letter. Um, and uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on the efforts from the FDA that can impact the field of cell and gene therapy specifically on the points on expedited review and the type D meeting. Thank you. Yeah, so, right, so, um, uh, so there have been meetings added uh, as, uh, as part of uh, the, the new PDUFA, uh, the new PDUFA commitments. Um, uh, uh, additional meeting type has been added, uh, type D meetings. Um, uh, and uh, that was uh, again done to uh, try to provide sponsors with uh, yet another way of um, uh, of, of interacting uh, with the, uh, uh, the the agency over a narrow set of uh, issues. I think the idea here is that for a Type D meeting, uh, you will uh, allow you know basically shorter timeline to have. Uh, a, a discussion about very focused topics. I think the maximum you're allowed is two topics uh, 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 in order uh, to, uh, and, and that the idea there is that that could happen uh, in a more rapid manner uh, than it has been we've done in the past. Now, um, that to me is, is very much in the spirit of what I'm, I've been talking about in terms of trying to have um, this kind of more ongoing dialogue. Um, it's still a formal meeting request, um, but it's uh, on a, uh, a, a, very, a very specific limited number of topics. So it's not wide ranging. And the idea is that we could probably have these meetings much more rapidly um, uh, than uh, we are, uh, we're, we're able to with, you know, the typical type C meeting where uh, sometimes sponsors come in with, you know, a dozen questions um, and that means it takes it takes our reviewers a long time uh, to to get through those. Um, the 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 piece of this, though, that I think that that you're you're also getting at um, is how do we deal with um, our ability to rise to the occasion um, and staff up because that's part of the Padufa commitment letter, and we're very grateful that as part of Padufa Seven, uh, we'll staff up by about another hundred people. Um, in, uh, in our Office of Gene Therapy, plus an, another, I think another 40 to 50 in other offices that support cell and gene therapy. Um, that will make a big difference. Um, it, it's not, it doesn't sound like a lot of people, but given that right now we probably have, uh, uh, in terms of devoted to 
uh, gene therapy review, um, that that's a doubling probably or, or, or so of what we currently have devoted to this. Um, so it should make a, a significant difference. Oh, that's great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, turning to another question now from, from online, this is from, uh, from Sean Kogan. Uh, they ask, is the FDA concerned that by generating a cookbook for developing and manufacturing bespoke therapies, that they could hinder new innovation from sponsors in that area? Yeah, really, really good question. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I, I think that's a, that I, I haven't thought about it that way, but let, I, I, I guess I can think about this in terms of, um, in, in terms of the Maniatis cookbook in molecular biology. Um, many of us tweaked those formulas. We had some basic thing and that gave us a starting point um, and it's human nature to tinker. And so we used that starting point and tweaked. Um, so I would hope that what would happen here is that we would not put these things, I would not want to see us put this into any sort of hard and fast guidance, right? I would want to let the field be able to evolve the way it sees and, and tweaks. And I think this is, we didn't, we didn't touch on this, but one of the real challenges that I see, and I don't have a solution to this yet, so I'm just, I'll just say it, is we're in a field here where there's a lot of evolution necessary, right? Products can evolve faster than we can make the changes in our formal regulatory structure um, with submissions right now. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're aching to keep up. So I'm not too worried. Um, I, I'm not too worried as long as we don't decide to make some standard that, oh, it has to be X, Y, and Z. Um, as long as we say, here's the cookbook, you know, if you find a little more salt makes it taste better, be my guest, um, I, you know, uh, change the recipe. Um, I think the idea though is that by having a recipe that you change, you at least foster consistency and make that easier. And we should make it that it can be tweaked because one would expect that as we do this more and more, we're going to figure out what uh, works better and better. Um, uh, and eventually it might transform itself into something different. If you think about it, look at what happened with DNA preps, right? We used to, we used to spend time making our own bottles of various solutions. Now everything's done with a kit from a certain manufacturer. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, it, just, it just shows you where things go. And I guess I'll follow up with a related question um, about about the the bespoke therapy initiative. And my mind turns to you know, what what does potency assay development look like for for bespoke therapy? What 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 are the expectations? <laughs> yeah, I know, it, believe me, it's a hot topic at the, this conference, uh, and, and and that's not going that's not for bespoke therapies. But I can imagine the challenges uh, for you know pr producing these these products for such small populations. What? Yes. Sorry to give you a heartburn there. Yeah, well, that, they, a little bit of heartburn. That's why there's the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, because they're trying to work on some of these challenges, which is that, you know, there's the potency. So you've got the issue of how do you characterize the actual vector that you're making, right, which are going to be characteristics, empty capsids, full capsids, residual uh, DNA, et cetera. And then there's how do you capture the potency of the insert, right, mm -hmm. especially if you're only dealing with... Huh, uh, you know, 10, 20 uh, doses of a gene therapy. So um, uh, more to come, that, but people are thinking about it, that you're probably going to have to think about, um, you know, think about a, a standardized way of doing it, but the, the answer won't be the same for each, right? It's, you're going to have to have, you might have a way that you set up to capture potency, but the answer is not going to be the same for every product. So um, there are some challenges here. And, and Heartburn. I, I I get out my big bottle of, uh, of 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 calcium carbonate tablets now. <laughs> yeah, I, I turn to mine almost on a daily basis. Absolutely. I'm trying. I'm trying to refrain from using brand names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, understood. Understood. Well, well, uh, Dr. Marx, th thank you so much for for, for joining us uh, th this morning. Uh, it's always a pleasure to to have you and and, and to share your thoughts about the direction of CBER. And, and cell and gene therapies. Um, and uh, I, I would encourage everyone both 
here in person as well as online to uh, join us again at, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, where we will reconvene and have our, our regulatory session uh, where we'll, we'll hear from regulators uh, all around the world. It's uh, sure to be a, an excellent uh, conversation. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you very much.